So good morning, and uh, this is the Barrick Public Virtual Workshop on Traffic Identification. My name is Michiel van Dijk, and together with Klaus Nieminen from uh, Finland, Traficom, uh, we are the co-chairs of the Open Internet Working Group of Barrick. Um, and um, my task is to mainly introduce you to the moderator, Kurt Erik Lindqvist. Um, he will take you through the workshop. Before that, um, I can give some general background to why Beric wants to host this uh, public workshop. Um, as most of you may know, we have been recently uh, updating the Beric guidelines on the open internet regulation. And in the public consultation, of those guidelines, we we noticed some uh, interesting uh, information points on uh, traffic identification possibilities that may not be ex exploited as we speak. So new technologies, and we wanted to find out more about uh, the future of traffic identification. Uh, also, because it is uh, a topic that seems to become more and more interesting in the in the coming years um, so this is uh, a place where we want to inform ourselves of the technological and economic uh, possibilities uh, of traffic identification um, yes to take you through the practical things you can engage with the speakers via twitter using the hashtag barrack workshop um, depending on the time, speakers can respond to these uh, questions. We have a panel session, uh, which we will uh, use for more in-depth discussion. So uh, questions for uh, understanding can be asked after the presentations, um, but questions for discussion will be addressed uh, during the panel uh, part of this workshop. Um, all presentations will be available on the BARG website. Uh, and uh, Barrick will also, in due time, publish a, a summary of uh, the workshop. Um, on the next slide, then, uh, is the start of the presentation of Nokia. So herewith, I would like to hand over to Kurt Erik Lindqvist, who will take you through the uh, presenters of the panel and the presenter presentations. Thank you, Mikael. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is um, Kurtet Lindqvist. I'm the CEO of the London Internet Exchange, and I'll be uh, the moderator for today. Um, the first presentation we have today is uh, from um, Mr. Francois uh, Fredericq and uh, Mr. Florian Damas from Nokia. Um, Mr. Uh, Fredericq is a senior research uh, and developer engineer uh, with Nokia based in Antwerp. Uh, he has spent most of his career in the telecom world, mainly at Alcatel Lucent, uh, which is now Nokia. Uh, and uh, he has focused his work on um, access technologies and access platforms such as XDSL, XPON, uh, FTTX, um, and has looked at encompassing most levels of the system from a uh, physical layer, Ethernet, IP, MPLS, uh, QS and application awareness and uh, uh, O&M and management. He's involved in project coordination and operation, cooperation between multiple parties, uh, either within uh, Nokia or between partnering companies uh, inside project frameworks uh, or at uh, the level of international uh, standardizations and forums. He holds an uh, MSc in engineering from Ghent University. Uh, Mr. Damas is uh, head of 
policy and regulatory affairs uh, and based in Brussels uh, with over 14 years at Nokia uh, working from product marketing to policy and regulation and uh, the last 10 years uh, in the regulatory team and he's previously spent 11 years with RCEP, which is the French uh, National Regulatory Authority. Uh, Mr. Damas represents Nokia on telecoms and data issues uh, relating from the cloud and software-defined networking to investment policies and funds, public policies, competition and net neutrality. Uh, he's responsible for the development of corporate positions on key regulatory and thought leadership issues for Nokia and advises regulators and competition authorities to ensure infrastructure interoperability and competition. Uh, Mr. Damas holds uh, an educational background in engineering, telecom, computer science, as well as marketing and communications. And with that, I'd like to start the first presentation. I'll hand over to uh, François and Florian, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to give you an overview of traffic management and differentiation, mostly from the point of view of uh, fixed access networks and aggregation networks. And uh, we will have uh, several other presentations following, which will dive more into the uh, mobile aspects. So if we could go to the first slide, please. Um, if we look at the situation today, what we have in terms of, uh, of uh, communication services, we have, broadly speaking, the Internet access service, and then, on the other hand, we have specialized services. So if we look at the Internet access service, it is characterized by being fully open, so you can reach, you have connectivity to whatever endpoint in, in the world or the, over the Internet. Uh, you have lots of over-the-top services that can flow over, can, can be carried uh, across this service, but the service itself is agnostic about which particular application is being carried. Uh, from the management of the network perspective, uh, we take care of the efficiency of the network. However, internet access services typically do not have a specific QS uh, applied to it, so that's why we talk about best efforts. Uh, handling of the traffic of internet access services. On the other hand, for specialized services, uh, there's much more involvement from the provider network or, or from the operator, um, both in terms of uh, functionality, because for instance, for voice over IP, it will be the uh, operator that will take care of all the, the signaling of the, the, the service, also the carrying of the, the voice itself, obviously, uh, and the billing, etc. Uh, also, another example is IPTV, where you would have uh, interaction with the uh, set-top box. You have uh, also the, the, the billing aspect. You have multicast in the network and, and so on. So for these special services, which require some specific uh, QS, there are some guarantees that are offered uh, based in, on the network uh, handling of the traffic. So there are some SLAs and there are some QS guarantees. Um, so that's a main differentiator. So the, man the network is managed for both efficiency and QoS, and it is for a very specific service that is being offered uh, in conjunction with the, the operator. So when you look at all the, the possible applications, um, actually any application as such can run either as a specialized service or on top of an internet access service. Not all applications have very strict quality guarantees, so some are easier to carry over internet access service, others are more difficult. And so specialized services uh, are used when we have some very specific QS guarantees uh, that are then translated into SLAs. Uh, next slide, please. So starting from there, we can also, we could extend this situation by defining different types of internet access services. Uh, so for instance, here you have two types. You have type one, which would be the plain vanilla type, and which would be equivalent to what we have today. But you could also have uh, another type of internet access service that would be more optimized for any kind of gaming application. So just to be clear, this internet access service would still allow you to use any kind of over-the-top application would be, still be completely open, but if you would have a, whatever kind of gaming application, it would be uh, more performant than uh, a plain vanilla-based uh, type of service. And of course, you still have also the, the specialized services on, on the other hand. Um, so you, you see that in this 
flight, I've shown that all these services would be uh, shared, would use the same resources of the network. So the network resources would be shared uh, over all the services. Uh, if we look at the, the next slide, you could also go for uh, slicing, um, whereas where you would still have a common part of the resources that would be still be used by all services that can be very basic resources like just powering or or uh, air conditioning or monitoring or billing or things like that. Uh, and then you can have next to that those common resources, you would have some dedicated resources per slice and you're actually free to, uh, to, to define what kind of uh, service would go in what kind of slice. But uh, for instance, you could have a slice dedicated to plain vanilla internet access services with some dedicated resources. You could have a slice dedicated to the, the gaming type of internet access service and you could have a slice per specialized services. Um, in that way, you have uh, a deeper level of control of the resources that you use in the traffic for carrying simultaneously uh, all these types of, uh, of services. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when we look at really in general, in, in the network, uh, well, networks have come through a tremendous evolution over time, uh, especially in terms of, of throughput of bandwidth. Um, but there will always be a congestion in the network. Even if you continue to upgrade uh, all the links, all the capacities, you will still be facing some congestion. And that's really due to the nature of the communication. For instance, the TCP protocol will always try to take whatever throughput it can find, uh, so it, you will always hit some, some, uh, some limit over there. On the other, also, you have to look at, from an economical point of view, you cannot just dimension a network uh, for offering a peak rate to every end user uh, simultaneously. That's just not uh, economically feasible. Also, you could have some failures in the network and that need to be taken into account. Uh, the last mile itself has some physical limitations. Uh, for instance, in the DSL world, the longer the distance, the lower the bit rate you can reach. So you cannot, you can still continue to improve on the technologies, but you will always have some limitations. And even at your uh, end home, you could have interference from your Wi-Fi, for instance. So you could have some congestion there at your home network. So congestion is happens when the instantaneous demand for traffic is larger than the capacity that you have at a particular point in the network. And the, the result is that your packets will get buffered uh, in order to wait for the right time to be sent. But who says buffering says delay. And who says buffering that continues and that overflows means packet drop. So this means that these two, delay and packet drop, will directly impact your quality of experience of your application. And this means that you need to control uh, the performance of the quality of service in the network. The quality of experience is what the end user uh, notices of quality of a service that is being consumed. And you can translate these expectations into uh, performance metrics in the network, QoS performance, uh, which would typically be throughput, uh, latency, etc., cetera, packet loss. Uh, so this is shown on, on the next slide, uh, where you have a very schematic Yes, you, you have a, a list of possible applications. Uh, and here, these are just examples. For instance, internet, mobile backbone, broadcast TV, video on demand, and some sensors, IoT network. So these are different applications. They each have QoE requirements or expectations. They can each be translated into QoS guarantees. And then, based on these QoS guarantees, you have the network that needs to act upon the traffic in order to uh, meet those guarantees uh, and the, the, the main the core of this uh, this mechanism is the are the traffic management mechanisms so what you do is you look at different types of uh, guarantees that you want you have them in traffic categories for instance internet access service or mobile backhaul or IPTV or some streaming or low latency IOT and then you map this traffic category into traffic classes, for instance, best effort or backhaul, or whatever video, or whatever low latency transport. And based on these traffic classes, you will differentiate the traffic 
in your network based on those classes, and you will treat, you will handle this traffic differently in the networks. You will have different priorities, you will def have different uh, queuing mechanisms for these types of uh, traffic classes. And this is managed by uh, the operator's uh, rules, the operator can set which rules to follow in the different points in the network, and some traffic engineering in order to uh, make sure that the capacity will be sufficient for the expected uh, traffic in the network. Uh, this is also shown in the next slide. Uh, it's a bit the same story, but shown differently and to, in an end-to-end -end perspective. So on the left-hand side, you have an end user uh, wanting to use some kind of application. And uh, that application uses some protocol and is based on some operating system on the terminal. So this already these points can influence the quality of service. And then the network, in the nodes of the network, you can have the traffic management mechanisms that will uh, handle in the best possible way this type of traffic uh, following the different uh, traffic classes. These are represented by the, the little cogwheels in the different points in the network, so you can have it in your uh, residential gateway, in your access node, in intermediate switches, in the routers, and in the edge of your network. Next slide, please. Um, on top of that, you can also um, apply slicing in your network. Uh, so the, 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 the picture is rather similar to the previous one. You have end users, they have to go end-to-end -end through network towards their application server, for instance. It uh, could be also conversation, but this is ju here just an example. And you could have uh, different end-to-end -end slices in your network, represented by the, the two colors here. And they are actually um, uh, represented in the different nodes of the network. So, for instance, in the access node, you would have two virtual access nodes, A and B. In a switch, you would have two virtual switches, A and B. And in the router, you would have two virtual routers, A and B. And they represent resources and uh, actions on the, the traffic that are dedicated to that particular uh, type of uh, application, or to that slice. So, for instance, you could have de dedicated capacity or you could have dedicated processing power for particular uh, protocol exchanges and so on. The slices themselves are controlled and managed by uh, a stack of controllers uh, so you start by some orchestrating layer where you have all the inputs of different services and endpoints that want to use these services. From that, you have a virtual, an image of virtual networks that you would like to build in your network that goes to an SDN controller. The SDN controller generates virtual resources that need to be reserved in the network. And then finally, the network resource controller will uh, do the, translate this into the actual configurations and monitoring of the different nodes in the network. Next slide, please. Um, here is a use case of uh, mobile XO over uh, fixed uh, networks. So you, as you know, you have uh, different flavors of XO. You can have front hall with the RU on the cell side and then a DU or CU uh, somewhere located higher up in the network. You can have mid-hole in the middle, where you have the RUDU at the cell site and CU higher up in the network, or you can have a uh, full integrated node, G node B, at the cell site, and then you have backhole towards the core of the mobile network. Um, the fixed access network is composed of a series of nodes. So you start at the, the cell site itself, you have a CSG or network terminator, uh, then you have an access node, and you can also have some pre-aggregation nodes. Then you have an aggregation network with aggregation nodes, routers, and edge nodes. So you, you have a transport network in green that sits in between uh, devices of the, the mobile network in, in uh, blue. Uh, so part of your RAN is actually composed of these uh, transport networks. Um, so what you need in order to, um, to support the different QoS expectations for mobile traffic you need uh, some mapping or some uh, unified course framework between the uh, differentiation that is happening at the mobile side. So these are the QoS profiles uh, and the traffic classes that you carry in your transport networks. 
And so you, you need some kind of uh, translation or mapping between these two uh, parameters at both the uh, cell site uh, location and at the mobile core location. And by doing this, then you have the, the uh, different types of mobile services that are carried with QoS awareness. And so you could have voice over new radio, you can have mobile uh, broadband, you have URLLC, you can have machine communications. Uh, so these mobile applications are then carried across uh, the transport networks. Uh, small uh, point here, you can have also um, more distributed uh, edge clouds or edge computing uh, as close as possible to end users to guarantee those applications that need very low latency. So you can have a mix of uh, mobile functions and uh, fixed functions in the network. It's the, the, the blue, uh, sorry, the, the yellow dot that you see on top. Um, but the, the message is here that the, the transport networks will use the same tool set of traffic management techniques for uh, Excel traffic as is being used for um, non-mobile traffic like uh, VPNs, IPTV or whatever. Next slide, please. So as conclusions, um, three, three points to, I'd like to make. Um, the first one is that traffic management is widely used in fixed and mobile networks. Uh, because congestion will happen, so the effects of congestion must be mitigated, else you will have uh, degradation of your services. Traffic management, it's a standard practice. It's really a tool set uh, to support both specialized and internet access services with QoS guarantees, and that's so the way to do it in an economically uh, possible way. Uh, and it is based on differentiation of traffic classes or differentiation of traffic flows. Uh, but does not require content inspection or discrimination between applications to offer internet access services and to offer specialized services. Uh, additionally, you can look at slicing to bring more isolation between the different types of traffic. Uh, it is as such not required to be used, but it allows the operator to have a deeper level of resource reservation uh, and a high level of control when deploying its uh, applications or services. Uh, slicing can also be used for opening up a network to virtual network operators, uh, but that is not really the scope of, uh, of this presentation. Um, both internet access services and non-internet access services are relevant, and traffic management and slicing are enablers for both uh, by using traffic differentiation. So best effort IS is really the basic connectivity for all users and must be preserved. Uh, creating multiple IS services could help operators in adapting their offers to different types of customer requirements. And specialized services are used for uh, supporting users and services that have some very specific end-to-end -end, uh, requirements and they require some high level of interaction with the network or high level of control. Uh, by the network, like, for instance, voice over IP and uh, IPTV. I have a last slide, but I will not go into detail for the interest of time, uh, which is uh, more an illustration of this tool set, traffic management tool set, uh, and where it can uh, have some impact on QoS uh, metrics. But if needed, we can maybe come back to that during the discussion. So um, I would like to, to end my presentation here and take any questions. Thank you very much, Francois. We have had a few questions uh, during your presentation, but I think we're going to save them for the for the panel because they're more general and not on your particular presentation. Uh, I don't think we have any clarifying questions. So um, thank you for now. We'll come back to you at the at the panel session. Um, <clears throat> and uh, with that, we'll move on to the next presentation from Ericsson um, by uh, uh, Louis Martinez. PhD. Uh, Mr. Martinez is the standardization manager and based in Stockholm. Uh, he has over 18 years of experience as researcher and project manager in the telecommunication industry, uh, including technical, business and regulatory studies uh, in areas such as quality of user and customer experience, net neutrality and mobile networks. Uh, he is currently responsible for radio product standardization activities and regulatory support. Uh, Mr. Martinez, uh, uh, 
previously held a postdoctoral research uh, at KTH uh, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and he has a PhD in uh, techno-economic analysis and design of qualitative experience uh, oriented mobile networks. And he also holds an MSc in telecommunication engineering. Uh, I'd like to remind you all that you uh, can ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag uh, Berek uh, Workshop. And, uh, uh, and, you, uh, and we will ask them, and you can ask them if you want any clarifying questions for the presentations. We'll take them directly after the presentation. Otherwise, we'll hold them to, uh, hold them to the panel. Uh, but with that, uh, Louis, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Luis Martinez, and I'm going to talk about 5G and traffic management. So we can go to the next slide, please. So um, the first thing that we have to mention is that 5G is use case driven. So all the previous technology ge generations were basically developed to address only consumer demands. For example, voice and text for 2G, browsing in 3G, and higher speed data rate and video in 4G. With 5G, we see um, a new scenario propelled by three basic areas. Massive machine type communications, critical machine type communications, and enhanced mobile broadband. Um, in all these cases, we find diverse requirements in terms of traffic, number of devices, throughput, energy, and more. For example, for massive machine type communications, we see a usage scenario where connectivity for millions of devices is needed. Uh, and, and in terms of quality of service, the requirements are not highly demanding in terms of bandwidth or latency. Uh, for critical machine type communications, a scenario with ultra reliable considerations, um, the demands in terms of throughput, latency, and availability are more stringent. And if we talk about enhanced mobile broadband, the demands focus on, on providing first massive mobile connectivity, higher data rates as possible, and try to lower the levels of latency, increasing the end-to-end -end response. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. So considering the above, um, the network complexity levels will increase. Uh, with services varying their quality of service demands, uh, the network needs to manage not only higher volumes of traffic, but also the increased levels of a specific quality of service requirements linked to this traffic. To cope with this scenario, um, we required an orchestrated solution that combines different alternatives. Um, in one hand, uh, is basically increasing the network capacity and offering solutions like carrier aggregation, massive MIMO, uh, requesting for higher frequencies and looking for network densification. And on the other hand, we also need to work on developing and using mechanisms to handle the traffic in a more efficient way. Um, this is what we call a build with precision. And it means to apply <coughs> what we call the multidimensional approach um, to propose solutions that not only address the network capacity requirements, but that also use the network management and considers the quality of service requirements and the traffic demands. Um, Next slide, please. So when, when we mention, when we say build with precision, this implies a combined approach. Uh, one, where traffic analysis and logical segmentation can be combined to secure the best performance in 5G networks. Um, it's worth to mention that traffic management techniques have been present in the networks for a long time uh, as a mechanism to guarantee um, an adequate management of the levels of quality of service for the services running in the network. Um, when we talk about 5G, what we see is that this quality of service concept has been embedded in the operation of the network, um, especially considering that um, we are handling different types of traffic and different use cases with different traffic characteristics. So in 5G, um, the quality of service is enforced at what we call the, the quality of service flow level. Um, this means that in each flow, uh, the packets are classified and marked according to certain quality of service requirements. Could be the delay, could be the packet loss. Um, 
So it's associated to the performance. And this, this, um, this flows is associated to uh, a quality uh, flow uh, identifier, uh, which can be specified as, as a pair of the 5G quality of service identifier or the 5QI and the allocation retention priority. The idea is basically that the behavior of the quality of service flow will be defined according to what these two uh, parameters indicate. Later on, I'm going to explain with more detail how this, this process is, is, is managed in the, in the 5G network. Um, in addition to these mechanisms, uh, 5G also develops the concept of network slicing that was also present in 4G, but now is, is, is part of the core of the 5G uh, considerations. And with network slicing, uh, we would permit the implementation of tailor-made functionalities and network operation according to the quality of service requirements and needs of each uh, slice and each customer. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Okay. So, um, when talking about traffic management and an important concept appears and is the traffic identification. Um, in this case, the traffic provides, the traffic identification provides elements to understand better the traffic behavior. And, and this is important because um, this is the main, uh, the main element or the main uh, instrument to, to allocate resources for the, uh, within the network. So traffic identification provides elements to understand better the traffic behavior, how this traffic performs and behaves in the network and what type of demands it has. So with this input, uh, it will be possible to determine the strategies to be implemented in order to fulfill the quality of service demands. So if we talk about the typical traffic identification techniques, uh, this can be classified in, in two, let's say, main groups, uh, the packet level identification and the flow level identification. Uh, when we talk about packet level identification, basically, <clears throat> we look at the, at the packet header. Uh, we look at uh, parameters such as the port information, the IP address, or a quality of service stack um, to trigger some traffic management techniques. However, now that, for example, some applications and services use port numbers that were originally allocated to other services, it's not possible, or it, it's not possible to offer an accurate uh, use of the port-based method. Uh, on the other hand, we have what we call the flow-based traffic identification technology, that it's built on the concept of IP flows. Um, the IP flow is the summary of a group of IP packets that share the set, a set of common properties and that uh, are evaluated when they are passing through a network observation point during a certain time frame. Um, the idea in this case is that we look at the common properties that include, for example, uh, destination and source IP addresses, port numbers, and protocol types, and we use statistical methods to analyze the characteristics of the flow, for example, the number of packets, the flow rate, uh, and so on, to achieve the purpose of identification. Um, at the end, the goal with traffic identification is to allow an adequate mapping between the 5QI and the quality of service characteristics. Uh, if we go to the next slide, here I'm going to explain uh, with more detail how the 5QI operates. So as mentioned before, the 5G quality of service model is based on the use of, of the quality of service flows. So these flows can be classified as those that require the guaranteed flow bit rate and those that do not require a guaranteed flow rate, uh, float uh, bit rate. Uh, the 5QI is the mechanism used to classify the packets in different quality of service classes. So in this way, the quality of service can be tailored to specific requirements. Each quality of service class has its own assigned quality of service characteristics, such as packet delay and packet loss. An example of this could be seen in the table in the slide. Um, so basically, uh, as a result of, of this classification, we can 
uh, provide different levels of quality of, of service to the packets according to the requirements defined in the in the 5QI table. Um, and the packets identified then are assigned to a quality of service flow and mark with a quality flow indicator. Um, as was mentioned also by, by, by Francois in his presentation, uh, we have in 5G, we have the radio access network and the core. And in both parts, we uh, try to ensure the quality of service by mapping packets to appropriate quality of service flows and also the data radio meters. So in 5G, the quality of service flow mapping uh, happens two times. First, there is a mapping of the IP flows that we have identified previously to quality of service flows. And from the quality of service flows, uh, the, uh, we, we also map this to the data radio beavers. So in the 5G core, there is only one single user plane function uh, for transport of data between the G node B and the core. And the G node B, uh, it's also responsible for applying or mapping individual quality of service flows to one or more uh, data uh, radio beavers. So all in all, it's the identification of quality of service flows, what makes it possible to handle and offer different quality of service guarantees uh, and later define how they might be managed within a network, including a potential use of a network slice. If we go to the next slide, what we can say is that um, at a very high level, uh, network slicing is a concept where logical networks are created on top of, of a common infrastructure. So when defining network slices, uh, 5G can be used to partition the network resources into logical slices, uh, catering for, di uh, for different dimensions of the requirement uh, and the required uh, characteristics. So the challenge foreseen for 5G are mainly centered around the flexibility of supporting a multitude of new use cases and offer tailored customer service where it's required to address new needs and new quality of service requirements. Um, this also brings the need for a flexible and agile response to traffic changes. And the challenge here is to address um, or to meet the great variety of requirements and use cases while making it simpler to operate and faster to deploy new services, offering a domain separation and reducing any potential risks in terms of uh, capacity allocation or security provision. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So network slices are assumed to share um, the underlying infrastructure, meaning we share cloud, transport, access, and could share also some other components. Like for example, uh, we can have a common control plane for, for the packet core. In 3GPP, where this is technology has been defined or standardized, a network slice instance is defined as a complete logical network. And when, when we say complete, uh, it means that it contains all the resources that are required to fulfill the purpose of the network. This means that uh, it extends beyond regular network function and can also include dedicated management functions, including, for example, the quality of service ones. So different network slices can be equipped with different capabilities and quality of service provision goals. Um, in the next slide, we are providing uh, an example of the use of network slicing. So we can mention here uh, a railway system with two network slices defined to fulfill two different use cases. Both are handled by the same radio access network infrastructure, but they have the different requirements. So in one hand, we have the, rail, uh, the railway uh, slice, and on the other hand, we have the mobile broadband slice. So in the first one, uh, we can identify three different quality of service flows with a different priority level. In this case, this priority level is associated to um, some delay requirements, uh, driver communication, security cameras, entertainment and board. They, they have different delay requirements. And in the second slice, we have uh, one that offers a common infrastructure for public mobile broadband. In both cases, the traffic management criteria are independent between the slices, uh, which guarantees at the same time um, uh, an adequate use of resources and distribution of the resources, of the network resources. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can just mention the conclusions. 
And to conclude, we can say that uh, 5G is developed to provide services with the highest quality of service attributes. Um, in this case, we are not only addressing the, the uh, to provide a better user experience based on, on the classic case of mobile broadband, but we also want to address um, the tailored characteristics of new cases uh, that requires, for example, ultra low latency, ultra reliable communication, low energy consumption. Um, in terms of traffic, uh, uh, the traffic management is key for the achievement of quality of 5G quality of service goals. So the network capacity is combined with traffic policy in order to guarantee the fulfillment of the quality of service indicators. So traffic identification and measurements are crucial elements for creating high quality uh, network services. Finally, we can say that uh, network slicing and traffic management are the tools to realize the full potential of 5G. So with network uh, slicing, 5G network might be virtually split up into several logical networks that can be tailored to the specific quality requirements of application uh, or services. And that the network slicing could be used to provide internet access services with different quality of service levels and non IAS services, uh, in, in this case, providing an adequate resource distribution. So thanks for your attention. And that's it. So I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, <clears throat> we have had some further questions, but I think I could, I'll, I'll save them for the panel. There's nothing really uh, particular on your uh, clarifying on your presentation. So um, thank you so far. And we'll uh, come back to that at the, at the panel stage. Um, so with that, we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, again, I'll remind you if you have present questions on the presentations to use the Twitter hashtag uh, Berek Workshop in one word. Uh, the next presentation we have is from uh, uh, Thomas Yamikovic uh, uh, from GSMA. Uh, he is the Senior Director uh, of Public Policy uh, Europe, based in Brussels. Uh, he leads the GSMA's Policy and Regulatory Affairs Department in the European region, uh, representing the GSMA to EU institutions, and, um, national governments and regulators. He previously uh, worked at the Council of the European Union, uh, planned and prepared uh, the Lithuanian presidency of the Council uh, in the field of telecoms and digital policy and chaired the EU Council Telecommunications and Information Society Working Group. Uh, he has uh, uh, spent three years as an IT management consultant and an advisor to the Lithuanian Chamber of Commerce in the United Kingdom, and he holds an MSc in leadership and an MSc in enterprise information systems. So, uh, Thomas, with that, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Kurt, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this kind of introduction. Um, can, can you hear me well? Yes, yeah. yes, that's good, thank you. Maybe I'll just stop my video because I have a bit of a lag here. Uh, so just let me know if, if there's uh, an audio issue uh, on my end. So thank you again for, for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I said, my, my name is Thomas Yekimaritus. I represent uh, GSMA, Association of uh, Mobile Communications Industry. Uh, and in my presentation today, I, I'd like to link the uh, regulatory policy element with the technical element of today's topic, as I think I probably am the only one on the panel uh, directly working on, on, on policy issues, uh, so to speak, less so on the technical side, but I'll, I'll try to link the two and uh, complement the previous uh, presentations. Um, so next slide, please. So before I go into uh, service identification considerations, I think it is important to um, underline uh, that New better guidelines and what they what they support and uh, with regards to the topic. Um, I think I think it's rather important to do so. So uh, what guidelines support is different speeds uh, in quality for IS services, different classes of traffic treated equally, and uh, quality differentiation for specific services. Uh, of course, where objectively necessary, uh, lower quality also may be supported to benefit certain services such as low power IoT and Zero rating following uh, data cap uh, can also possibly uh, be uh, allowed to uh, 
service specific uh, to support, for example, educational services or .gov resources. And um, what is important is that all of these require service identification. And uh, here we uh, bump into some uh, real world uh, issues and elements to tackle how, how to achieve that. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, here I'd like to talk about uh, a little bit um, 4G network operation and quality assignment and assurance principles, and uh, which are used by operators. And so already without waiting for 5G, um, the load of a mobile base station and our cell is, is supervised in real time according to a certain number of resources. And it, it, those could be static or dynamic. And uh, if thresholds are reached, then the base station can set up a defense mechanisms so, so to limit the load and maintain an acceptable quality for, for the users that are present. So the following uh, elements allowing to implement this quality assignments and insurance functionalities are standardized by 3GPP and uh, I think we lost you there, Thomas. Thomas? Can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, no, I can hear you. You're back. Yes. Hello. Okay. Sorry. So I, yes. I don't know where I was. I cut off, but uh, yes. Uh, I will. I will just repeat that. When, when it comes to three GPP, uh, operators use these three different uh, levels um, for quality assignment and assurance uh, functionality. And well, the first one is uh, for access to the cell. Uh, also, it's called preemption in case of congestion. Uh, the second one is for access to the bandwidth, and the, the third one, if we go deeper, is for the flow through service passes that that can be implemented. Uh, to, to provide uh, uh, specialized services or services other than IS with a quality of service level distinct from the one uh, which is IS. And when it comes to the first level, um, what, I, what I'd just like to briefly go through is that when, uh, when you access the cell, the terminal asks a signalization channel in order to ask for bandwidth. And the access class parameter of the IMCI is used and the access classes here are defined from 0 to 15 uh, as an example to illustrate just uh, emergency calls, uh, well 112 only uh, primarily are associated to access class 10 for example. Um, of course the access class is independent from the service and only emergency services have the specific access class here. Um, so the network, when receiving the request from the signalization channel, it analyzes the access class of the SIM card and uh, in function, the network provides the channel or postpones the demand. So, 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 so to address it. Um, when going to the second level, where asked for the bearer, the terminal will ask for a service and uh, the allocation and retention uh, priority or IRP parameter, um, which uh, also is from, from one being the highest priority to 15 being the lowest uh, is a prioritization of the source. And of course, each service you can associate with a different uh, ARP parameter. And then going further down to level three, uh, where flows are prioritized, uh, once the signalization messages are exchanged between the network and the terminal, the service is set up with the, with the associated quality of service. So the QCI parameter or quality of service class identifier, as we call it, and service classes are defined by, by the norm for each user. So for example, voice over LTE has a specific QCI as well. And um, all in all, when thinking about this, uh, this norm, it lets the operators to, to associate the IRP and QCI parameters for each service, but it has already fixed uh, the QCI parameter depending on the usage, like um, I mentioned before, for example, for emergency services. And uh, as I said before, these levels, uh, all, all of these uh, parameters of, 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 uh, of these levels um, vary depending on the service. So for example, emergency services, they need a high level of priority, but no real quality, uh, or the services regarding the security of the people, will also need a high level of priority. Uh, for example, media uh, voice over LTE will need 
different level for these parameters, but at the end, the technical mechanism remains the same. Uh, so that's um, in, in a nutshell in, in terms of quality assignment and assurance principles uh, used by operators. Um, next slide, please. So from from the operator's perspective, um, you know, as ISPs, we can look at things, uh, but there are limitations, so to speak, and, and these limitations make it difficult to identify traffic. And with this table on the slide I, uh, that outlines communication metadata used by the network to identify services, I, I'd like to illustrate that regardless of the information level, you know, be it URL, domain, destination IP address, or heuristics, um, visibility actually decreases over time. And of course, it, it does so on, on different levels. But the, the point here is that it, it does decrease and it makes it uh, difficult to, to identify the traffic. Um, next slide, please. So um, what I'm leading to is um, that we have some policy constraints on, on service identification. And um, here I'd like to show you an example that illustrates popular internet protocol stacks. So as, as instructed by uh, the uh, new Berry guidelines, transport layer payload is considered specific content uh, and ISP should not use this data in, in traffic management. And that is the uh, provision by paragraph 69 and 70 in the guidelines. And well, this implies that none of this metadata uh, can be used to identify services, including the domain name. Uh, and because of that, ISPs cannot see service layer, uh, which is on top of the transport layer, uh, be you know PLS, quick or or DNS, uh, and it just simply hands over this uh, to uh, OTT players, so to speak. So with that, it stops ISPs from delivering things, and at the same time, in a way, it's a perfect position for OTTs that can see DNS, uh, for example. So here again, uh, one could say we identify yet another level playing field related issue, and I, I think this is. Um, an important angle to, to to look at when considering how um, to um, uh, overcome these policy constraints on, on service identification. Um, next slide, please. So, in relation to my previous slide, I'd like to outline some of the questions that require clarifications. And, um, well, all of these questions, uh, in a way, hint that we'd like to clarify if the answer is indeed yes to all of them uh, from the ISP perspective. Um, maybe in the interest of time, I, I would not expect to discuss these questions this morning, yet I hope that um, these will be looked at and, and would provide food for thought uh, to the members, uh, hopefully to the members of the Barrick Open Internet Networking Group, um, because I think it's, it's, it's important to, uh, to look into these concepts. And uh, just to to conclude, I'd like to know that you know, as previous speakers mentioned, overall, you know, we're dealing with traffic identification, which is an evolving issue, and modern traffic identification systems are used, you know, are, are used and using multiple sources uh, for 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 delivering the exercise. And overall, I'd say traffic management measures will evolve over time and uh, we have these technical solutions contributing to better quality uh, and a more efficient, more dynamic, more flexible use of network resources, which um, we believe Barrett should also in encourage. And uh, so, so as such, um, we would have this supported environment. And from the operator perspective, we support a more efficient use of networks, which is of critical importance at a time, especially when data use is increasing exponentially and uh, and we want to deliver high quality service. You know, efficient use of networks, as um, Louise has mentioned in his previous presentation, is is, is really critical. Um, also, uh, at the time of COVID-19 crisis, when as an industry we're working to provide reliable services. And on the top of that, to reduce emissions and, and ensure uh, our networks are energy efficient as well. Um, 
so those are my, my, my final thoughts. And if, if you turn to the next slide, um, I'd just like to thank for your attention. And uh, before I conclude, I'd like to know that uh, from the GSMA's perspective, uh, we, together with the European uh, mobile operators, we have provided uh, to Beric previously some of the considerations when it comes to traffic identification, uh, going back to the uh, um, contributions provided uh, to public consultations when uh, the new guidelines were uh, considered uh, back last year and the, at the beginning of this year. So we, we hope that these uh, will be looked at as well. So, so to make sure that we have this um, support uh, for a more efficient use of networks, uh, especially in, in, in these uh, challenging times. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, all the questions at the Q&A session. Thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, again, we haven't had uh, any questions particularly for you. Um, so we, uh, I think we'll move on with the presentations. Uh, so next up is Yanis um, Yakamus uh, from Selfie Networks. Uh, uh, he is the co-founder and CEO uh, based in Stanford, California. Uh, Self Networks is a stealth startup in the networking space. Uh, it builds technology to democratize partnerships between application providers and mobile operators and enable innovative network services in the presence of net neutrality. His previous exper uh, experience includes eight years as a research assistant at Stanford University and one year as a software engineer at Google. He holds a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from Stanford University. So with that, Yanis, I think I'll hand over to you and I think we'll have a, a, a demo video as well. So uh, this will be the usual excitement. Uh, thank you, uh, actually. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for hosting this workshop. Uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to, join, uh, to join this today. Uh, and, uh, and share some of the insights that we have by working on the intersection of uh, traffic differentiation, both from a combined technical uh, policy and business perspective, and, uh, and share with you the insights that we got from that and the work we do with network tokens, which is a, a new uh, mechanism to expose and access network traffic differentiation services and network SLAs in compliance with net neutrality and privacy. Uh, this is joint work with Nick McKeon from Stanford University, uh, Frode Sorensen from Encom, and uh, Tom Herbert from Intel. And uh, I want to start by acknowledging that these are very, very exciting times for uh, our community. Just 10 years ago, all the discussion around traffic differentiation was mostly at a philosophical level around competition. And, and today we have uh, a situation where uh, traffic differentiation services are widely, widely deployed, uh, zero rating and voice over LT. The major application providers use them to improve the user experience uh, in, in all different countries, both in developed countries and emerging markets. And we now have a net neutrality regulatory framework that allows uh, traffic differentiation. What is more important, though, is that we are sitting at this tipping point where all the hype around 5G, as all the speakers mentioned beforehand, is around customizing the network behavior to better meet the needs of individual users, uh, application use cases, etc. GSMA puts this uh, slicing opportunity up to $300 billion for the industry, and this is what drives a lot of the hype and the use cases that, uh, that we are listening to. And so I think it's worth uh, stepping back a little bit and wonder uh, what are uh, what is the role of traffic identification uh, within that context. And I'm I'm going to make a claim that traffic identification is essentially where end users, application providers, operators, and regulators meet. So everyone who is attending this workshop, I think, should be very very uh, 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 sort of like careful about the role of traffic identification in everything that we discuss around privacy, around net neutrality, and how these are impacted by traffic differentiation. So if we're talking about user-centric and application-agnostic QoS, it's the traffic identification mechanism that will provide these uh, capabilities in the network. When we're talking about inclusive category-based uh, differentiation for zero rating, is the traffic identification mechanism 
that will dictate the onboarding cost for new application partners and whether this can be truly inclusive or not. Uh, user consent is the traffic identification mechanism that will provide these capabilities. And the same goes with uh, ease of deployment, ease of management, auditability, and so on and so forth. But the reality is that the existing mechanisms that we have, uh, namely traffic classification and low level mechanism with no security primitives, uh, do not meet these needs. And uh, I want to walk you through um, a simple workflow how traffic classification works and how does this impact in practice the, the, the properties that we run around openness and, um, and, and privacy. So let's assume for a moment that we have a network that provides three different levels of SLAs, the green one, the blue one, and the, and the red one. And let's say the red one is the low latency uh, uh, SLA. And the way traffic classification works is by starting from the network saying, I can guarantee low latency for Skype calls. And in order to do that, the network needs to be smart enough when it forwards traffic to detect which traffic comes from Skype so that it can make the right action. So as the user is sending traffic out, the network looks at this traffic, identifies the packets that come from Skype from a combination of IP addresses, ports, domain names, uh, uh, more dynamic application signatures, make the call and forwards the desired traffic through, uh, through that path. Now, the problem that we have is that for every new application, the network needs to add new intelligence. And this is something that it's hard and it's expensive both in terms of cost, but also in terms of performance. And so you end up with these very bloated boxes within the network that need to identify hundreds or thousands of applications and every new one comes with additional cost. Now, even when this happens, this is largely inaccurate. And the reason for that is that application providers change their applications. So they add new IP addresses, new domain names, they use third party traffic. So the overall identification based on traffic classification is inaccurate. And what happens in practice is uh, uh, they are topped up with a very manual, expensive and error prone process where application providers have to manually coordinate with the operator uh, about identifying this traffic. And this involves multiple teams in both sides. The problem with that is that every organization, every company has limited resources, right? And the more difficult this onboarding process is, the harder it is to add more. And so essentially you end up having a very limited number of applications that can access these SLAs just from a logistical perspective. And the last point is that everything is application specific. Right, which means that the network needs to identify the application in order to provide an SLA, and this has two problems. First of all, it doesn't provide user control semantics. So if a user wants to drive this differentiation, we don't have the means to do that. And the other is that it's privacy invasive. So the network needs to understand the application that it's serving in order to provide the service. And this is uh, something that uh, is, is just like becoming harder and harder. And so it's going to be impossible to operate in the network. There has been a very, very uh, um, uh, well uh, a driven process from the internet community to obscure all the traffic. And this is where uh, protocols like DNS over HTTPS, encrypted transport, uh, handshake, as Thomas mentioned, are coming in play that hide all this information from the network. Just to give you a sense, uh, we've been involved in this process. We've done more than 100 integrations between major application providers and mobile operators, primarily in Europe. And from these, eight out of 10 failed as part of this process because of the, the overhead and how manual and inaccurate they were. So this traffic identification has a real impact on what uh, we want to see in terms of inclusiveness and, and, and user, uh, user choice semantics. So we, we started thinking some time ago, how can we expose and access these traffic differentiation services in a way that is, first of all, easy for operators to deploy and operate, it's easy for end users and application providers to access, respects user privacy and user choice, and works with encryption and, uh, and modern infrastructure, taking into consideration CDNs, uh, multi-cloud deployments, third-party APIs, etc. 
And network tokens is essentially a mechanism that addresses these challenges. So it's an open and secure method for end users and application providers to explicitly coordinate with the network about how their traffic is treated. And this can be to access a 5G slice, a low latency path, or a zero rating service. Uh, some of the characteristics of network tokens, uh, they, uh, they carry simple claims. So, for example, a token might say, I'm Skype, or I need low latency. And they say this uh, with, uh, 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 by adding secure primitives, so they can be encrypted or signed based on the trust relationships between the different uh, entities in the picture. They are inserted uh, as extension or attributes in existing protocols, uh, like IPv6 or TLS or STAN, and they are policy agnostic. So tokens can be uh, 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 include any information. So they can be just a user-centric application agnostic token, or it can be an application-specific token. And the policy is not dictated by the token mechanism itself, but by the way that we distribute this token. So who gets access to the token and how. Before going into uh, a little bit more details on how tokens work, I want to show you a demo uh, to give you a sense of the workflows that network tokens uh, enable. Uh, a lot of the discussion uh, in Beric has been around how we can enable user-centric services, and we want to, I want to show you how network tokens can enable user control in a very simple and intuitive way. So we are working with a, um, a operator industry consortium uh, to uh, to demonstrate and 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 and, and showcase the the, the um, uh, implementation and use of tokens. And essentially, we have a, a, a setup where we um, uh, implement a network SLA and expose it to users in the following way. We're saying that every user has access to a standard plan, which is the best effort service, and this comes with a certain price tag: like fifty euros a month, twenty euros a month, you name it. And then on top of that, every user has access to a premium network quality service that comes uh, uh, at a higher cost. So it's one euro per hour. And you can use this when you have a critical uh, workload that you want to make sure that gets the highest reliability and guarantees from the network. Uh, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to share my phone here. And this is a live demo, so I hope uh, it works well. But what we did here is uh, we took a, a, a mobile app and we added this tokens capability. So tokens comes as an API that any developer can go and integrate in their application. So here I have a video conferencing application. And let's say what I want to do is I want, as a user, I want to make sure that all my video calls uh, get the highest priority for the network. What I can do is I can come here on my settings and there is a premium network quality knob. So I can click this knob and when I do this, there is an agent in my phone that knows how to get and uh, go and get tokens from the network. And so it tells me, hey, Yanis, there is this application called Jitsi that requests access to your network account in order to access the premium network quality services. And this comes with the, you know, the cost and what are the, the properties of this. Do you want to accept it or not? So the user essentially comes at the forefront of giving access to, uh, uh, to this high network SLA to an application provider and brokers the relationship between the network operator and the application provider. So the moment I accept this, what happens is this agent goes, fetches a network token from, uh, from the network operator, gives it to the, the, the video application. And now every time I make a call, this call carries a token, which can be detected in the network and drive all the QoS provisioning uh, within the network. And the important thing that I want to uh, communicate here is that this type of provisioning, the user-centric approach, can happen in a way that it's really simple and familiar to users. This is very similar with the way that we're giving access to our location and then we can revoke it. Uh, it's based on our own consent and it has clear uh, semantics on who get access and to add information. If we look a little bit behind the scene on how this works, going back to our original example with the different SLAs, the process with network tokens starts from an application asking user permission to access the premium network quality service. This triggers a call to the operator to go and fetch a token with uh, the user's credential. And from that point on, the application developer can insert tokens 
just the flows of interest that can actually improve the QOE, the, the user experience through this, uh, by leveraging this as a link. What is important to understand here is that the network has no idea which application it, it sort of like, uh, it prioritizes. This happens in a completely application agnostic way. So the network just sees the tokens, understand that it's the user's desire that this flow gets prioritized. It doesn't have to look at the content, identify the service, et cetera. And from that point on, the network just detects the tokens and provides the desired service. So the benefits that we get essentially is that the more application we add, there is nothing that changes in the network. The network remains exactly the same. And the only thing that it needs to do is to, um, is to be able to detect and verify these tokens. And the policy can be dictated by token distribution. So if we want to have a user-centric service, the tokens need to be driven by the user. If we have an enterprise scenario or an IoT scenario, the tokens might be driven by the application or by the enterprise owner. So you can very easily dictate and audit and manage different policies depending on whether you are in a mobile broadband scenario, an enterprise scenario, or a private 5G scenario. One comment here, and this is sort of with um, uh, relevance to the talks before, uh, tokens are not something that act by itself. Internally within the network, they can use the existing mechanisms of 5QI, DSCP, and so on and so forth. So you can think of tokens as carrying this trust and accounting across different administrative domains. So from the user domain to the network domain or from application domain to the network domain, but within the network, once you interpret these tokens, you can use the existing mechanisms like 5QI and QCI and betters to go and make sure that every node in your network can actually uh, 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 provide the desired service. So where we are uh, in terms of uh, status and traction. Tokens is a new uh, technology. So right now we are uh, implementing it, working with the different stakeholders uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that it has success. Uh, so there is an open specification. Uh, uh, it's uh, in standard tracks, uh, and it's it's sort of worked by the IETF community that uh, describes both network tokens as the underlying mechanism, and also the workflows that sit on top of this uh, to provide user-centric provisioning, etc. We have engagements with different operators, application providers, network, and OS vendors um, uh, that are looking to add uh, the use of tokens in their, uh, in, in exposing and access their SLAs. And the last thing that we have is what we call OVO 5G, which is uh, essentially over the top voice and video over a 5G slides. And this is the demo related with the demo that I showed you where we are building this uh, open reference implementation to show how we can expose a premium network quality service tailored for voice and video calls. Uh, and you can access more information on networktokens.org. Um, how we work with, um, uh, with this, uh, um, uh, blueprint implementation, essentially we're compiling a working group with operators, voice and video providers, vendors and regulators. And we are making sure that the, the standards and the compliance with existing protocols and the implementation, it's open and accessible to everyone so that they can use this in their network, experiment and make sure that it meets the requirements for their own use cases. If you're interested to, uh, uh, to test and try any of these, just, uh, just contact me. Uh, there are many ways to get involved and this is an open call for any of you from the regulatory side or the operator side or uh, um, um, uh, NRA side to get involved. Uh, there is an active discussion and mailing links at ITF that you can participate and monitor. Uh, a lot of the code around network tokens is open. So if you are an operator or an application provider and want to see how it works, you can access it on GitHub. Uh, you can read and contribute to the spec and try it in your network. So wrapping up, uh, main points that I'd like to iterate on uh, is the importance of traffic identification uh, as the, uh, the nexus where end users, application providers, operators, and regulators meet. The existing mechanisms are not sufficient and they cannot support expected growth. And uh, network tokens is an approach to address the main challenges uh, that 
combine traffic differentiation with privacy, encryption, and net neutrality. Uh, uh, we have compliance with privacy and net neutrality as top design priorities, and uh, tokens right now are implemented as a starter track internet draft presented within the ITF community, and there is running code uh, that implements them uh, along with uh, operator industry consortium. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, otherwise I'll just uh, wrap this up so that we can move on. Hello? Hello? Yes, it works now. Okay, great. Let's see what... Okay. We are all back. Oh, so we, we should be all... Uh, we should all be back. Um, uh, apologies for that. Uh, it's always um, uh, interesting to do this, uh, these live conferences. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll report. I'll re uh, report Kurt, my Kurt, Kurt, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Apologies, uh, I'm just waiting for our IT colleague to let us know when we can talk again. He had to. Uh, he had had to pause the, the live stream as well. So just bear with me for one moment. Sure. Okay, can Can you all hear me? Um, I, yeah. I think I was dropped off. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, we, we, uh, Thomas, we've, we've had a problem with the, uh, with, the, uh, with, the with the connection and the, the WebEx. So I'm just waiting for our IT colleague to get us uh, started up again.
So just bear with me. Okay, uh, I just need to share something. Uh, he's just asked me to share something, so bear with me. Um, okay. Can you see this uh, this slide for panel discussion, guys? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. yes. So he just needs to adjust the stream. Sorry for this. Okay, we're, we're just bear with me. I'm going to kill the sharing here and we're ready to go again. So, Kirk, you can take it okay. away again. Right, thank you. Uh, apologies for that little technical uh, hiccup there. Uh, we'll, we'll restart the panel discussion and so I'll, I'll restart with my question. Uh, this gave all the panelists a little bit more time to, to think about great answers. Um, so, um, uh, my, uh, I was going to start the, off the panel by asking, so we have heard a lot about um, uh, this uh, uh, prioritization of traffic, identification of traffic in, in either through traffic classes or through uh, uh, the network slicing. But all those models we heard today is, is pretty much inside the network, while uh, when I uh, what we talk about here is end to end, and uh, most of the time that endpoint, the other endpoint from my communication, isn't inside my operator's network. If I go and watch Netflix, it uses streams from Amazon, from from perhaps Akamai and other other sources. H how do we see this working across a multitude of a true end to end com um, identification and and traffic flows uh, in and prioritization? Because this is between networks most of the time. Um, so maybe I start with Francois, who was the first presenter. If Francois is back. Yes. Hello. Um, yes. Well. You, you I think at, at some uh, internet exchange points, you can have agreements between different parties uh, to, to recognize uh, also QoS uh, types of, of well, different levels of uh, QoS. Um, you, you mentioned Akamai and others, so indeed you can have uh, content distribution networks that can also have some caching capabilities inside the operator's network, so that is certainly with uh, collaboration there between the, the two parties. Um, and for the uh, specialized services offered by a particular operator that is mostly within its own domain, so there the, uh, the question is not really raised, but indeed for over the top uh, services, you can cross multiple different parties, and so that's a relevant point. Think they lost Francois? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm still here. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, yes, you. So, so I think um, it needs some some agreements at different exchange points where you, if you want to, to go end to end. Um, so every domain is is uh, free to to do its own mapping on traffic classes, its own handling decisions. Uh, so you, you do need some some interaction at the exchange points. Uh, anyone else want to add to France or Louis? Do you want to come in here? Or, or? It, it will be basically to, to support what Francois was saying. So it comes or it's related also to uh, uh, particular agreements in, 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 in these intermediate points within the network. So how to define the SLA's levels and the expected quality of service levels uh, from each part of the of this negotiation so they or this agreement so um, it's it's um it's up to the, the 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 two parts of this agreement to define this these characteristics uh anyway the traffic uh, the identification and the prioritization all the uh, setup of these technical functionalities is uh, is activated based on what that is defined in the sla Thomas, and you want to add anything, or so, 
Sorry, was a mute. No, I, I think both uh, Luis and Francois uh, provided quite quite sufficient answers. Um, not, nothing much to add up to that. Thank you, Yanis. Yanis is a mute. I can see you talking. So. <laughs> Yes, so uh, I, I think, you know, uh, we can uh, sort of like start with like smaller complexity tasks while we're go and then like go to, to bigger and bigger ones. If you look at the main use cases where the network becomes relevant, and I think from a, from a quality of service and latency and, and QoS perspective, there are uh, two ways to think of this. One is to just reduce the, uh, uh, bring the, the resources closer to the user. So it uses the geographical uh, distance from a user to the resources that they want to access. And this is where all the discussion about CDNs and CASIs and edge networks are coming in. And then the network can sort of complement this by making sure that we have the uh, a good provisioning. Uh, so we can, you know, I think uh, when we're looking at the use cases, we're looking at what is the the smaller complexity we can start with, like how we can go within a scenario where we have a single operator, where uh, the operator and the application provider and the user are all tied under the user's desire to prioritize something. Once you involve multiple networks, this becomes a bit more complex and you have different type of relationships uh, to take in place. And, and definitely there are peering agreements that are left outside uh, of the considerations of, of, of how we regulate this type of SLAs. Um, but I think from uh, from a, a, a pure regulatory perspective on these SLAs, um, there are ways to look at these at smaller increments of complexity, what you do within a network, and then what you do in multiple networks, and so on and so forth. So, uh, I mean, this is a great introduction. I mean, it leads me on to, um, uh, if I'm allowed to play devil's advocate here a bit, but who, who becomes the customer in the future? Uh, we, we heard that this would be uh, down to the agreements between the operators, but uh, who is the customer? Is it the end user or is it Netflix or is it both? Because obviously there is a chance here for the operator to sell the same traffic twice. Um, any, any thoughts on this? How, how do we see this, this evolving? Um, anyone wants to, wants to pick that up? Nope. <laughs> I, I, personally, I think that the main customer is the end user. And the end user can be, uh, you know, a, a consumer or can be a corporation. But at the end, these are the entities that are using uh, the, the applications. These are the ones that understand how important the SLAs are. Uh, and these are the ones that have the direct relationship with, uh, with an operator. The, the role of the application developer, I think, is largely to, um, enable a user to add their network resources to have a, the best experience that they can have. So if you look at, you know, uh, on a Netflix scenario or, or on a Zoom call or on a WebEx, it's me as a user that know whether this is call is critical and whether I'm willing to pay. If you look at a more uh, IoT, it's the factory that has all the different equipment that uh, wants to make sure that they're willing to pay uh, higher for better QoS. So I think just broadening this from the actual user's perspective, it just simplifies a lot the uh, uh, the, the provisioning and the cost and the and the buying scenarios in in these type of cases. That, that's a good point. I I I I'd like to come back to one of the, the starting points of um, this is maybe uh, for Francois where we said that the uh, the traffic flows we said your product price is based on the service. But if I take a service, for example, as Netflix and to Yannis' point. Netflix today, the developer, the application developer, I mean, this is a multiple company, but um, I'm just using them as an example, might actually choose to, to deliver this service instantiation from a number of providers. Me as a user, when I send the request across the network, um, that, um, if you do traffic classification, how do I classify the, the, the return traffic? Because the request might go to one application provider and today's return traffic comes from multiple sources. How, how does the network deal with that? Well, Francois, do you have any, any thoughts on it? So maybe to, to clarify your question, so you see when request goes through one path and the, the, the answer comes from another party. Or, yeah, so I send my request to watch the stream from to the Netflix, uh, mm -hmm. but Netflix uses Amazon's local caches or Akamai or whoever they use to actually deliver the content. 
the networks has has little or no idea that this this downstream the return traffic is coming from it's the same request I sent but it's coming from a different source. Mm -hmm. how, how do you bundle those applications together? Well, the, bundling them together can have two two reasons. One would be for a QoS treatment, and there what really matters at the end is the the correct uh, marking of that traffic in order to to have the good prioritization in the network. And in that case, uh, I don't think it, there's uh, a lot of, well, you don't need a lot of, of uh, binding between the request and the, the reply because it's the reply that will carry your traffic that really matters. So there it's the marking that matters. The other one it would be for a, a billing purpose where you would like to, to identify uh, consumption by a particular user and verify it by the, um, what it was really consumed or, or generated in terms of traffic. And uh, th that would be more of a reason to, to do a binding between the two. Um, now, for over-the-top services, uh, typically this, this billing is more, well, the operator in, in the middle is not really involved in that, uh, unless the, the operator itself would offer that kind of service through its own network in a, in a managed way. So if you would have um, a Netflix uh, subscription by means of your regular operator, over the set -up box of that operator on your television, that would be part of the billing of that operator, not part of the billing directly by Netflix. So it, it acts as a as an intermediary. Uh, the, this operator between the service it is offering to you with some QoS guarantees compared to if you would consume it it uh, directly over the top without such QoS guarantees. Uh, so I, I'm I'm not sure what the um, if for, for the current uh, way of consumption, I'm not sure that poses a, a problem to, to bind. If you go, a request goes one way and the reply goes another way, in my opinion, that would be for an over-the-top consumption. Uh, and that would be, for billing purposes, the operator would not be a part of that. But if I'm if I'm the gamer subscriber versus, so what you're essentially saying is that this is down to the subscriber, is essentially the, the identificator of the service I get, not the application. I, I will. Uh, is is that the correct interpretation of that? Well, if you say for for a gaming example, uh, if you would, you you could think of um, an access service, an internet access service that would be uh, optimized for gaming, but it would not be for one particular gaming platform. It would be for gaming in general, and in that sense, the the subscriber would pay more for such kind of of uh, better. Uh, IIS, Internet Access Service, for the purpose of being to, to game and have a, a gaming advantage. Uh, but it would not be in that kind of uh, deployment, it would not be for one particular gaming application that uh, would have to be recognized by the network. It would be its traffic would be recognized irrespective of the, the gaming application. Okay, um, thank you, Francois. Any, any, Thomas, Louis, you want to come in on this, Janis? Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, actually, adding to what Francois mentioned, <clears throat> in the network, you you need to see that th this is a two ways, two directions communication. So it depends also on the type of flow of information moving from the user from the end, one end to the other end. So in the case Netflix, you are. You, 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 you might face a scenario where you are just streaming in the downlink and also receiving or perhaps receiving some uh, small requests from the uplink side. In both cases, it's possible to implement certain quality of service classification, downgrading or probably though, um, lowering the, the, the requirements for a simple request of a video. It, it will be perhaps a short message a uh, few number of packets requesting for a video, while the downstream, uh, uh, including the whole movie or the series you want to see, will prioritize with some other level because in this case, uh, we are talking about uh, different requirements in terms of bandwidth, in terms of latency, in terms of jitter that is associated to this type of traffic. In the gaming example, if you are playing with some, some other friends, in this case, um, the classification or the, the allocation of resources will be based, as Francois said, uh, on the 
category of traffic associated to this to this flow. In this case, category is it will be gaming, uh, without precising what type of application, what type of game you are playing with, um, and the packets will be treated as gaming packets with certain level of priority. The improvements in the performance can be also associated not only to the quality of service mechanisms, but also to um, allocating more resources or increasing the capacity of the network. But that's also something that will be decided after all between the end user and the, the network operator. Yeah, so I want to make a point here, uh, uh, right? The I think if we look into this gaming thing and, and think of gaming as a category, the main challenge that networks have is that gaming uh, is is HTTP traffic. It's quick traffic, so it's traffic that it's the same as everything else. And the main uh, uh, challenge that the traffic identification technologies are trying to address is how can I say that this specific HTTP flow or this specific quick flow should go over the the, the gaming SLA, right? And and. I think from an SLA perspective, yes, you can build something that it's tailored to the needs of gaming. So it can have low latency, it might have some uh, flexibility to drop packets, etc. But the main challenge is, okay, how can I say whether one flow is uh, is game and it's critical or not? And the question, the, the, the problem that we see is that the markings uh, are not made available, right? If you're a developer, you cannot really mark your traffic uh, within Android or iOS to go and leverage this capability. You cannot really uh, easily go into that better because these capabilities are not exposed. And the reason, and on your initial common curve, what happens with the downlink traffic? Okay, the uplink traffic, let's say we put a market in, how do we treat the downlink traffic that doesn't come from the user and it might come through different networks where the markers are being reset, etc. And the the reasons why we don't have this flexibility is that we don't have the means to do this in a secure way. So the existing mechanisms can be abused. Uh, there are no permissions in place. There is no invocability in place. So these are like uh, we can you know do things today. Uh, we can put them in demos and we can do demonstrations, etc. But when we try to put them in practice into real networks, they don't work well. Uh, and these are like the challenges that we see, and I think Thomas mentioned a lot of them uh, in his presentation around encryption, etc. But there are actually actual challenges on building these marking mechanisms in a way that is accessible to the users and the application developers, and we can get this done in a scalable way. I, I want to stick a little bit with, this, with, the, with the business starters, and I'm going to then move. We've got quite a few technical questions as well, so uh, we keep getting questions. So I, 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 but I want to say one thing is that we we um, uh, we talked about in this that there is a, a uh, we, we know that 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 you know certain uh, well customers applications you know are might be willing to pay extra to get a. Um, a, uh, a gaming experience or my live video and I have a premium subscription from the operators. But who are the people, and, and as I think what Francois who said that uh, congestion is more or less uh, inevitable in some places in the network, that means that some, some consumers or some customers will get a worse off experience. As, a, as an operator, how do I find those customers? Because finding people willing to pay premium for having the traffic actually get through is easy, but finding people who are willing to pay to not get the traffic, that's a little bit harder. Any 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 thoughts on how this this business model is going to work for the future? I mean, this has been uh, when I worked for telecos in from two thousand, we started to do this, and, and I remember this was a struggle to find those customers. Uh, why is this going to work this time around? Anyone want to pick that up? I'll I'll, I'll pick on Francois. Uh, uh, there we go, Francois. Do you want to start or? So if it's for identifying users that have bad quality, uh, or, or let's say that could well, benefit from a better quality, best effort, that's best effort yes. Um, well, you, the end user, they, they, they like to, to do, perform some testing, some uh, TCP good, good testing, and if they have really lousy results, uh, probably they, they will consider changing there. So that's, that could be a first uh, way for them to, to check. Uh, the quality of, of their of their line, 
um, for more um, well enterprise customers who would have a, a VPN service, they could also have internally inside their, their VPN network some monitoring uh, service that, that checks the, the quality of the, the service that is being offered by the operator. But of course, that's more that's out of reach for the uh, well, regular end user, let's say. Um, you, you can have some monitoring in the network, uh, quality monitoring, well, some QoS parameters can be checked in the network between different points in the network by uh, generating some, some uh, specific protocol, frames of some specific protocols. Now, the challenge there is more the scalability. Uh, you cannot let them run all the time for all the lines uh, to, to monitor it uh, all the time, but you, you could do some, some kind of uh, a sample sampling, a rolling sampling, for instance, uh, to of the, the capacity or other metrics uh, for the end users. Um, so I, I think that there are some tools available, but in, in terms of, of how to translate them into a business case, uh, that's a bit out of reach of my, my, uh, my scope, I, I would say. Okay, um, I, I, it's interesting. I, I'll, I'll pick on this for the next question. As you said, is um, we, we talk about this as the different service uh, in it, well, traffic in identification will allow different service categories, categories or, or service offerings to customers. Um, but as a customer, or because this is a very cool, maybe even as a regulator, how, how do I know that to honor this? How do I know that I get what I pay for? Um, it, I mean, that that's you, you touched upon that a little bit, Francois. But how can we? Exp how do you, as a customer, verify that I got the the priority over the other traffic that I, I actually paid for? Um, do, you, do you want to continue on that as you started? Um, well, for, for things that are measurable by the end user or perceivable by the end user, if he has a lousy video performance, you will notice uh, immediately. Uh, if you want to look, really check a, a quantified metric that becomes then more difficult, of course. Uh, for the end user from his perspective. Um, so, uh, well, I'm not really an expert on, on what the tools it, he could use uh, to, to check these uh, specific metrics, uh, but I, I guess it will would boil down to, to, to market choice. If he's unsatisfied with his service to, to, to change that service or to change a provider, uh, yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. Not sure about which particular tools he could beyond the, the, the simple uh, good put tools that he would that is readily accessible um, he would use. But for maybe it's also worth to, to say that the network itself uh, will try to uh, protect its own resources against uh, abusers of the system. So one reason that land users could end up with a bad quality would be that other users would try to abuse the system and consume too much or or generate uh, too much traffic of a given class so the, the the networks are foreseen on this to to perform some kind of policing of the the different traffic classes per end user so really down to individual subscriptions uh, in different places of the network and that's done not just for restricting and then to, to its own SLA, but also to protect the SLA of the, the other users. And if you have some failures in the network, you have some protection mechanisms that try to, uh, to, to make some temporary pass of the network of the traffic uh, until the, the, uh, the failure has been resolved. So it's not that you, you are, uh, well, you, you can be armed against, let's say, degradations or to protect the network from degradations in the network. Uh, from an operator perspective, from the end user perspective, yes, uh, I think it's down to its perception of the, the service that he, he will get. Thank you. Uh, Louis, Thomas, uh, or Johnny, if you want to add anything? Maybe a couple of thoughts to just add what uh, Francois has. I think the last one. Quality of service in, in, in terms of what, uh, what kind of. Uh, <laughs> Can, can you hear me? We can now, yeah. Okay, great. So, so just, just to follow up on what I said, I think in, in, in terms of uh, quality of service uh, from the end user perspective, uh, say for example, s s simple simple user, you know, uh, 
as Francois mentioned, if uh, if if the quality of service uh, or, or the bandwidth is is not satisfactory or not up to the standard, what the the uh, contractual agreement is uh, set for, uh, there there are tools how uh, how to check that even from the end user's perspective. Uh, you know, with uh, simple bandwidth um, measurements uh, applications and. Uh, Again, I think it's um, in, in the best interest of, of the operator to provide uh, a service up to the expectation because we have such a saturated market, uh, especially in Europe, when you think about it, we, we have over 150 operators and the competition is, is quite fierce and it's very uh, uh, easy for, for the end user to switch if uh, you know it, it, the, the service provided is not satisfactory. Uh, and in, in, in that regard, I think um, the, the situation uh, is uh, somewhat favorable uh, for, uh, for, for the end user community here. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, the unique exclusive situations, even in, in my own case this morning, you know, I, I was trying to make sure that the connection is going well. Uh, both of my kids are busy downstairs streaming different services uh, live on their devices. I mean, that might add something to uh, to the quality this morning as well. Uh, but again, uh, that that is just um, um, hygiene of 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 the end user uh, behavior as well. Uh, because if if you need a higher quality service, you, you need to make sure that uh, you're uh, using the uh, the service uh, provided to you in 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 the way that would would provide that satisfactory uh, uh, bandwidth, so to speak. So just just a few thoughts. Okay, thank you, Louis or Janis. Do you want to comment on anything? Yeah, I think overall, uh, first of all, the SLA monitoring is a hard problem, uh, right? And there are many different vendors and companies and operators that are working really hard to get uh, good metrics on how we monitor SLAs, how we make sure that we meet the requirements how we can uh, sort of get alerts, we can fix them right away, etc. Uh, but I think what's important is, is Francois' point, that at the end, it's the job of the network to provide uh, uh, SLAs that can really improve a user's perception, right? Uh, it should be, and because users don't care about milliseconds and latency, users want to make their calls uh, with no jitter and, and, and you know, with, with good quality. They want to play their game and the game to be very reactive. And so I think what we're going to see in terms of these SLAs and whether the users adopt them, et cetera, is that if the applications can improve the QOE, the application developers can look at the value, can understand whether this is something that improves their users' retention, their users' happiness, et cetera. And they have both the, the sophistication to understand whether this impacts real metrics and this has an impact on user experience. So they will be the ones to promote, to tell their users, hey, add this SLA because it will make you uh, 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 play your game better, et cetera. So I think it, it, it boils down to the user perception and the network will be successful on these SLAs only if they improve the QOE. And I think there are uh, up, up the application developers are working on behalf of the user. And if something improves their uh, uh, their experience, they will surface it to the user and they'll make sure that uh, users are aware and use these type of services. Thank you. Um, we're going to take some of the audience questions uh, and we have two quite related. Well, Louis, did you want to come in on, on the previous topic? Sorry. Yeah, actually, yeah, about the quality of experience. Uh, I, I, I agree with Yanis in, in the sense that at the end, what matters is how the user experiences the, the, the service is, is, is provided by the network. And there is a certain point up to the network performance can improve this level of quality of experience, but there is also a part of, of what the network cannot do. And it involves, for example, aspects like the interfaces, like the applications, and how they also become more attractive for the end user. So there is a point that can be covered by network performance, by increasing the network capacity, by implementing the, the traffic management techniques that improve the, the quality of service. But there is also this extra component that is associated to what goes beyond or can go beyond the network performance. And it's, it's, it's related to interfaces, it's related to devices, it's related to applications. Thank you. We, we just got a comment actually on, on, on the discussion we had here saying, 
the question is not just how the user can check if they get the quality they pay for, but how the regulators can assess whether and how much the IS quality of the non-paying users is deteriorating in the QS-driven network and interconnection market, which I think is why we, we covered that topic to some extent already. Um, but that was just one of the comments from the audience. Um, so I'll take some of the... Uh, 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 on, on the on the audience question, there's two quite related ones here. Um, one is, uh, the, the first question is, um, in the ongoing pandemic, operators have quite rightly been asked to provide access to education and public health information to subscribers for free. To do this, the traffic needs to be identified. Often the only way to do this is by examining the domain name and SNI in the transport layer. Do the panelists believe that this is a valuable service and uh, are they committed to continue enabling the offering of this community interest content for free. And there's a related question to this is, how does an operator verify, I guess this is also back to the interdomain question, how do you verify that a critical service is truly critical? How does an operator know that this is the correctly identified endpoint or end users uh, in this case? If anyone wants to pick that question up. Janis, please. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't have an answer on how an operator or a regulator dictates what is critical and what is not. But from a, a, a technology perspective, what is important is to make it easy for them to decide what is critical and what is not and make sure that everything that is considered critical can go in there. Right. And so this is like from a traffic identification perspective, what you want is that if somebody says that like all education websites are like critical then all of them can truly be there uh, uh, without essentially having a lot of overhead from the uh, uh, onboarding and from a management overhead within the network itself uh, and it's up to you know it's up to its operator and its country to decide what they deem critical uh, to do that. On the question of SNI, I think, you know, no matter what we say here, the SNIs are going to get encrypted. This is where the industry is going. The, the, by default, all the traffic will be obscure and we just need to have uh, some, you know, different mechanism, some explicit mechanism. And this is like, you know, related with the work that we do in order to make sure that you can still have these uh, access management uh, uh, mechanisms to make sure that in this critical situation, there is a way to do this in, 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 a, in a way that it's com compatible with encryption and privacy. Okay, any, any Thomas, Francois, Louis, any, any additional thoughts on this? That's it, that's it. Yeah, from a pure, uh, let's say, network perspective, uh, uh, the, 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 um, a tool is regulators and potential agreements how this could be used for example if it's necessary to prioritize uh, specific type of, of applications like educational applications or educational web pages this is something that um, you can you can tune in the system or tune in the network to make it possible um, how this will be implemented it will be also depend on the regulator And how all the other features uh, at the end will decide how it is and then uh, manage and operate it within the regulatory framework accordingly. Thank you. I think you're breaking up a little bit, but I think we got most of that. Um, Anyone else wants to come in on that? Otherwise, we have. Um, uh, I have another question on this from the uh, from the audience. Well, uh, similar is um, on the on the subscriber part. Um, in mobile communication, operators allow subscribers to top up and manage their bill online, uh, as it's um, well. That's most what, uh, what we all do today. Um, and for this, the operator allow access to the billing and payment services without charge. This includes the bank security validation systems. Um, do, do you think that this will uh, continue? And, and how do you think that you see this integrate with my online subscribing and billing uh, as I as I change my 
traffic priority or subscriber model uh, dynamically? Do, do you do we see a future whereby it gets uh, directly charged for for the premium traffic for for my video or my game? Well, maybe a very very high level comment, and it's not really about uh, predicting what will happen. But you, you have two levels in in the network. You have the the, the level where you treat the traffic for achieving some QoS, and then next to that you have uh, some some uh, some mechanisms for for billing purposes, and they do not need to be at the same granularity. So you could have you could go deeper for billing or less deep or whatever. So you these are two different things and we should perhaps not try not to 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 lump them together um and but as for operators policies uh, I'm, I'm not the best place to to comment there thomas or janis do you do you see a future uh, seamlessly integrated uh, mobile uh, dynamic uh, service offering No. Okay. Uh, so w w one comment here is just that, okay. like, if you look at the wired world, uh, we have different uh, different types of plans, right? So you can get something that it's 10 megabps speed, 50 megabps, 100 megabps, etc. And one thing that we can expect is that as we get better on managing uh, radio resources and programming radio networks is that we, we could have similar sort of like tiers of contracts in the mobile world. And this is fully compatible with net neutrality. Uh, by the way, there is nothing, you know, bad about this. This is like how we've been operating, et cetera. And, and so I think it's, you know, it, it's very likely once we get to a point where we know how to manage bandwidth and we can have like guarantees that we can have a similar model with what we have in the wild world where you can have different rates and its user decides uh, uh, what trade they want to pay for, and operators can monetize based on this. Um, so I don't know if this is, if this answers your question, but I think it, 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 it's been a matter that we so far we haven't had these tools on the wireless uh, world uh, to have the different tiers. And as technology improves, I think you know these are going to happen. It's one tool for an operator to have. Uh, different levels of service and let users decide which one uh, they're going to get. So, so, so maybe a related question to that, or, or uh, that we had that relates to Johnny's comment is that um, with, with 5G and and uh, well, and, and also in general, we're seeing this more seamless integration. We're talking about 5G being. Um, uh, integrated with the fixed wireless network, and we're seeing uh, the, the talk about much more integration at device level between 5G and, and wireless or Wi Fi and fixed networks. Um, how do we see this traffic identification when a device has maybe multiple exit points, both, both Wi Fi or mobile, or we start seeing or tries to start seeing seamless transition between the two uh, on a physical layer? How, how do we keep this in, in service classification, service identification? Um, if I have one single subscription, uh, uh, I mean, I have my mobile, actually, through my mobile operator seamlessly goes between their Wi-Fi and the mobile subscription I have. How do, how do, you, how do you see this classification working in that case? To me, this is only one single um, subscription, right? So the, the, the traffic class I paid for, I would expect across uh, both networks. How, how do we see this working? I think that the portability, that's kind of portability, it's, it's uh, not an easy thing to, to, to implement or to solve. Um, if you have one, <coughs> sorry, one device and it, it switches from mobile to, to a Wi-Fi, then it gets into the, the services that are offered to that particular fixed uh, residential gateway by the operator. Um, so in order to, to have, um, differentiation of traffic classes from that mobile device through the, the gateway, uh, it's more difficult than for a, a device that is connected physically to the, the gateway where you have a set-top box and that is 
recognized by a particular port on gateway or things like that. Uh, so so in, then we, we go back to either you have a, um, an, well, supposing it is some kind of over the top service, you fall back into your internet access service. And depending on which flavor you would have, you would have more or less uh, performance. Or you would have some way for the application to uh, also mark the traffic itself. Uh, but then it would have to be recognized by, by the network uh, accordingly. So it's really not a, an, easy, uh, an easy thing to, to achieve such kind of portability. Um, and let alone the, the billing, which would also be... Um, you would need to, to link the, the two billing systems from the, the mobile network and from the, the wireline network if you would like to do some differentiated billing or to do some uh, grouping together the, the volume that has been consumed in, in both ways. So I think it's, it's, a, tough, uh, it's, it's a tough thing to, to achieve. Uh, Louis or Yanis or Thomas, do you want to add anything to that on the... No. Okay. I was muted. I was muted, but oh, yeah, I was about to say that. Yeah, I was about to say that. Um, uh, yeah, there is a still some 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 issues with this uh, portability and this uh, multiple type of access technologies in 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 five G. However, when when three GPP defined the five G standard, it was also open to define uh, PDU sessions that can be set up within or between different 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 type of user planes and one of these could be IP but it's also po possible to create PDU sessions based on Ethernet and, and a structure basically the idea is to target not perhaps that me as a user can have a mobile phone connected simultaneously to the Wi-Fi and also to to the 4G network or the 5G network can interacting with the, the infrastructure but also but perhaps having the possibility to while offering a beer for the 5G terminal, having also the possibility to offer connectivity alternatives for, for sensors and other type of IoT devices. So it's not like a seamless transition, it's more like having the, 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 the possibility to manage two different types of sources or two different types of interfaces or, or devices generating traffic and, and handling or establishing communication using the 5G infrastructure. Perhaps in the future, we, this this could this could be possible, but still, uh, a lot of work to be done. Thomas, Yanis, you want to add a? Uh, sorry, Thomas or um, uh, Louis. Sorry. No. Okay. Um, sorry, maybe just uh, one additional okay. thought, Kurt. Um, yeah. Overall, you know, when 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 thinking about uh, you know all, all the questions that were posed, I, I think it's safe to say that it's 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 a, it's a, it's going to be a long, dirty, never-ending journey because you know we're we're never stand still, and uh, you know traffic identification and and detection methodologies are evolving. So uh, it's. Uh, sometimes well most of the times dif difficult to uh, predict or presume uh what the situation will be uh you know be, be it uh, two to five years from now or longer term and uh i think you know questions if uh say for example uh users will be uh, built uh, depending on uh on on their usage you know if, if it's video gaming or or so on i think for, for the time being, it's uh, it's difficult to to estimate uh, because the the technology there is is not uh, allowing us to uh, identify uh, traffic in, in in such a way, nor that uh, there is an intention to do so. Um, I think you know um, just because different categories of traffic are using the same port number uh, in, in practice, it's uh, it's 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 not reliable for for uh, for traffic recognition uh, and 
additional information is needed uh, to identify traffic which originates from uh, specific content or applications. So I think, uh, you know, in, in, in that regard, even if different types of traffic have their origin uh, in the same domain, categories of traffic like, you know, video traffic or, or be uh, originating from gaming, uh can cannot be uh identified as uh as, as easily uh, as long as it's uh you, you know um not uh, uh the the so-called uh um autonomous systems but uh it's uh, uh, it's across the internet so um in, in that i think uh, you know the, the relationship between the end users and uh, and 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 the operators is uh uh, is sufficient enough, and uh, I, I wouldn't foresee a situation where an user would be uh, treated uh, in, in 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 a way that would be uh, negligent or uh, uh, some somewhat disadvantageous, so to speak. Okay, um, I want to come back to the question we talked about before about the um, the regulator's role and the uh, assessing. Um, uh, how, the, how much of the IS quality of the non-paying users uh, in the network. And Michelle, I, I realize this is maybe more a question for the regulators, at least for regulators to introduce as opposed to the vendors. And Michelle, maybe maybe you want to add something to this. Yes, uh, thank you, Kurt Eric. Um, I think the, the question from uh, Mr. Thomas Lohlinger uh, combines uh, several aspects. Um, so we, we've spend some time on the question of course of what can end users do themselves in order to verify whether they get what they, what they pay for regulators try to support this by offering measurement tools and this is work that is having our attention um, we will spend significant time within the open internet working group on this uh, next year starting to update the uh, measurement methodology uh, we, uh, we use um, <clears throat> Sorry, but I think it also touches on on the more general question of uh, the the what does the future look like if I interpret it correctly? If the uh, the significance of quality of service uh, agreed on services are uh, is increasing, what is happening to the general uh, the general level of uh, the quality of the internet? Um, and that is a question for general for regulators in uh, looking more to the future i guess so uh, it's not a question you can answer very very simple uh, now because we are in the, in the middle of this development but i would like to invite the panelists to ask if they have uh, a vision on this so is there uh, uh, maybe taking a bit the position of uh, uh, of a, a, a critical end user is there is there room for a good general quality uh, internet uh, as a as a baseline? And what is this uh, is what is this product looking like? Uh, this market looking like in five or ten years when the, the quality of service uh, contracts are uh, are becoming standard? Uh, supposing they uh, they will be. Uh, from a technical perspective, I think it's uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay, Francois, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I think it's it's more of a socio-economic question, probably to to know if if it should remain, if you should have still an offer that is best effort, some some minimum guaranteed best effort at a very low price for people who cannot afford a higher quality or not. I think that's uh, of course that's lowest grade if you li would like to call it like that could also improve in quality over time as networks continue to evolve so it would not be uh, does not need to be a very bad uh, or shabby quality but some some fl flat fee low level low entry point for uh for socio-economic reasons could still make sense but that's more uh, another way to to look at it than a technical way of course Yeah, I was, uh, what I was about to say is that uh, from a technical perspective, uh, we are working on developing and, 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 and new type of solutions that make it possible to keep uh, uh, handling the best for traffic 
but also of response for new types of traffic uh, with specific quality of service requirements. Um, 5G is, is deployed or is, is has been developed with this, this idea or this concept in mind. And that's why we are combining the traditional quality of service uh, management techniques and the prioritization of traffic and the traffic identification, but also we are adding on top the possibility to create uh, network slices that can offer, uh, an, uh, let's say, an upgraded level of guarantee in terms of of, uh, of uh, separation or domain separation between uh, between types of traffic that can, if they are mixed, uh, can 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 generate levels of consumption or impact in a negative way the end user experience. So. By segmenting the network in this logical way, we are trying also to offer a better way to administrate or manage the, the, the network capacity uh, with, the, with one goal in mind, and it's to guarantee that the end user uh, will receive the quality of service that's expecting from the network. So that's basically one. Incentives uh, and, and how this, 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 this will be implemented, it's part of what, what the market, but also what the regulation will make possible and will allow, um, but the technology is there and, um, and uh, it's clear what's the goal of, of, of the network operators and the uh, standardization bodies by creating these new technologies. Just one comment, and uh, you know, apologies in advance if I don't use the terminology correct. But uh, I think we, you can, you know, QoS is not in uh, um, uh, in uh, it can be combined with an internet access service, right? So if as a user I can have access to different uh, uh, um, uh, levels of bandwidth of latency, and I can dictate. So if you have a user centric approach we can still combine QoS with an IAES. So it doesn't mean that we're taking away spectrum from the users and we're giving it to a specialized service that doesn't benefit the user and it's close to everyone else. So I, and again, I might not be using terminology correct, but I think you can still combine a user-centric QoS approach that is fully compatible with, you know, the internet access service. And uh, as long as it gives the user the means to do this in a, in a user-centric and application-agnostic method. And, and so I don't necessarily see these two things being in conflict. Uh, now, on the question on uh, if you want to look at specialized services and how you uh, uh, you make sure that, uh, that, that you do the balance on spectrum and resources, uh, this is something that I think uh, I will have to defer more on the uh, on the individual and arrays on how they want to to manage the spectrum on their own on, on their own countries. T Thomas, do you want to add anything? Last comment on that topic. No, I think uh, at this point in time, uh, no, no, nothing to add specifically. Thank you. The, the, we, we had another. The, the, the last thing, Kurt, that I want to see is that uh, another development that that has been happening recently is that uh, there are there is cellular spectrum, the CBRS spectrum, that is like specifically for uh, private cellular networks, etc. So this opens up uh, uh, it, it, and it's actively being deployed in in the US uh, at least. It's uh, so it opens up the capabilities to to have uh, cellular networks that do not compete with spectrum and resources with what is available as a, as public spectrum. So we, we, we have a, a, a audience comment and a question that is very uh, much related to this. And the, the comment is that uh, there is evidence emerging from the second UK lockdown that QoS is, is dropping significantly on the generalized internet and they're quoting uh, a lot of the independent um, uh, sources for this, but there's a question related to this is that um, going forward as part of this vision, uh, sh should the internet traffic be seen as sing a one single traffic category in the future? Uh, or, or we, you touched upon this slightly about this, and I think this is a little bit hidden in Michelle's question, but if we go forward in the future, do we see 
uh, generalized internet being broken up into into different parts, or different service categories, um, and, and we see much more more granularized control in this. Any 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 thoughts on this? And IIS disappears, and we're replacing with IIS one, two, and three in priority. Uh, that's a little bit what uh, I had shown in the beginning of my presentation. So you, you do have all the tools to to do this, uh, to to open up for different flavors of uh, IAS if if you if it would make sense uh, from the operator's perspective. And then it's a matter of choice. You you say you consider this IAS these different flavors uh, as completely agnostic for whatever traffic is flowing or if you would like to to do some more uh, classification per application then it becomes a totally different story from what is being done today i i think that the the concept of is will remain so it's in this the the, the access to 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 the source of information and exchange of of, of knowledge that 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 concept will remain what it's possible and actually that's uh, yeah and 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 and, and as have remarked even this presentation is that within this segment called IAS it's possible to manage different quality of service flows um but the creation of these different quality of service flows is targeting more inadequate traffic management that guarantees that uh, overall the internet access service will be uh, attended and managed with the what with what the user the end user expects as as high level of quality of service so if we treat different types of traffic within the internet access service within this category it's only with the goal of providing or improving the network performance and providing the best quality of service for the end user. And that's that's the basic goal. Thomas Yanis, any anything to add? Nothing I'm covered from my side. Okay. I'll um uh, I'm going to ask one last question, and I think we're out of time. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to do a very short summary uh, uh, of what you have said and look into your crystal ball. Is then as the uh, the application space and the uh, the internet usage space is becoming, uh, you know, going forward, where we see applications that are uh, micro components, micro submerged, and we have uh, uh, localized flows and and high project flows inside one single application. Um, as, as we look toward the future, how do we see the the, the future applications and cloud-based services uh, link into the future of traffic identification and, and those in this case? I mean, we, we talked about enterprises and and um, and uh, and the end users, but if you look into the in ten years from now in your crystal balls, how do we see this? Where have we landed in this? Where is the emergence of this? And I'll, I'll start with Francois some closing remarks. Um, I don't know if my crystal ball is very shiny, but uh, well, it, I think the, the question comes to down to will you see an explosion of more traffic classes than you have today, let's say, or more differentiation or more identification than you would do typically today. Um, so for sure, the applications continue to, to, to appear and to have uh, specific requirements. Um, I, I think there will some broad classifications will remain, whether it's a conversational service, where, whether it's a, a latency uh, tolerance service, whether it's a high throughput service. Um, so I think some broad generalizations will remain. Uh, I'm not sure if we will see an explosion of more finer granularity that will be required uh, to be applied to, to the traffic. Um, so, yeah, I'm not a good uh, <laughs> predictor on, on that, I'm afraid. Louis, so final comment? Um, personally speaking, I, I think that we are moving to a more personalized or tailor-made uh, offer of services. So, I mean that, yeah, we are evolving to a more user-centric 
specific uh, development of networks, at least from the IAS service, the specialized services, perhaps we, we are targeting another type of market. Um, but for the IAS, we will see the end user playing a more interactive role in the definition of the custom and the customization of the services, being more directly involved in how the service should be provided, what to expect from the network and also involved in, in the way the, the service at the end will be designed. And perhaps with the typical or the, the traditional way of classifying the traffic, it won't be enough and we need to characterize new types of traffic or new types of interaction addressing these new requirements from the end user. Thank you. Uh, Thomas? Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, as, as, as mentioned before, uh, we, we have a situation where these modern traffic identification systems, they, they really are a moving target. And uh, I, I would expect, you know, if, if I would have a crystal ball, you know, 10 years from now, I, I think we, we will see uh, an evolution, not a revolution, uh, in, in terms of these developments, because uh, there there is a good basis, and 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 the concepts will will be evolving. Um, so to achieve that more granular level, uh, I think in in terms of traffic management measures, they they will definitely evolve over time, and uh, new technical solutions will pop up. So to contribute to that better quality and. Uh, uh, you know, if, say ten years from now, uh, I think even more efficient, dynamic, and, and, and flexible use of networks resources will will be required, and and, and that will be um, developed for that purpose. And uh, as such, uh, I think operators will also uh, adapt in, in 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 this journey, and and will continue uh, innovating to to support that uh, more efficient use of networks, which probably will be. Uh, increasingly more more critical as as it proved to be uh, uh, at these times, and uh, I, I think there, there's a clear tendency that um, there will be an exponential use of uh, of, of traffic usage uh, be because of new services popping up uh, because of the uh, 5G technology that will provide these uh, these new services, and thus we will we will have to. Uh, evolve in, in, in terms of how um, traffic identification systems are, are, are being deployed in a, in a modern way. So that, that would be my conclusive thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Janis, some closing words. Uh, yeah, that's that's I think a, a great question uh, uh, for closing. Uh, look, I think applications are uh, you know are, are have a lot of things to manage. Uh, they they have to to do their own reliability distribution. Uh, they integrate a lot of like different uh, third party services, compute, storage, etc. So networking and specifically you know the different QoS that a network can provide is one of the many parameters that they have to balance out. And the way applications today and application developers consume things is through uh, open APIs, through flexible ways that they can essentially build and own their workload. Uh, so, uh, and, and I like to you know to look at things from from an application perspective rather than a network perspective because this is what dictates what uh, how things are moving forward. So I think from uh, from a network SLA perspective, in order to stay relevant, we need to just like bring these to uh, an easy way to the application developers to integrate these capabilities in a way that can better meet their needs and their need of their customers. And so I think, you know, we, we, we need to think of traffic identification and these SLAs in that perspective. Can it add any value? Can we make it simple? Uh, can we help them do it in a way that sort of doesn't uh, um, uh, impact the, the privacy uh, requirements that they have to impose for their users and so on and so forth? And so I think it, it's important to understand that the network is a small part of everything else that an application does. And in order to find a way towards their needs, we need to sort of like make it simple and, and, and have some uh, requirements that, uh, that encourage them to use these SLAs. Uh, rather than discard them today, and and this is essentially you know the the, the role of a big role of the traffic identification um, uh, mechanisms uh, is to act as this interface between the network and the application developer 
and create the simplicity, reduce the complexity, do it in a, in a way that is uh, the same across different networks uh, so that it becomes easy for others to, uh, to add this in the, in the user experience. Thank you. Uh, so thank you to the panelists. Uh, we come to the end. Um, I think we could ha have held an entire series of workshops on this topic. Uh, we have only, I feel, scratched the surface a bit. Uh, and and uh, I see there is uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what operators and consumers and customers do from this and what demand emerges and the use cases. Um, and, and also from the regulatory point of view, of course, what, what this means. But, um, but thank you very much for participating. And I'd like to hand back to Michael for the closing remarks. Thank you, Kurt Eric, for uh, wrapping up. Um, I, I found it very useful as well. And indeed, uh, we, we have plenty of things to continue about. Uh, so we will take back the input on the technical part, on, also on the more uh, global movements around the internet or the development of the internet ecosystem. Um, and see if, uh, or if I would draw see in which way we will continue uh, thinking and discussing about this. So I'd like to thank the, the panelists for their time and their useful, useful input. I would also like to thank the people that ask questions via uh, social media. Um, and of course, uh, thanks Kurt Eric for uh, moderating. Um, um, so to wrap up, we will uh, publish a summary in due time um, and we will uh, reflect on how to continue uh, discussing both the more short term technical slash regulatory questions. And um, I think we, we can also think about what role Barrick would have in the future design of the, um, of the internet ecosystem. Um, so thank you all, and with this, I would like to wrap up and wishing you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.